The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. Matthew 7, verse 21 to 23. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Allow me to present these verses plainly and simply. Not everyone who calls themselves a Christian is going to heaven. Not everyone who attends church on the weekend is going to heaven. Not everyone who proclaims to be a Christian or stands on a pulpit is going to enter heaven. God is not interested in your little religious mumbo-jumbo. God is not interested in your little religion that you put up on a pedestal. The world attempts to paint a picture of a God who invites everyone to come as they are and stay as they are. Live whatever way you want. Behave whatever way you want. Live whatever kind of lifestyle you want. But that is not correct. The God of this Bible has given us a way. We, as his children, should live our lives. The God of this Bible is a God that likes to get up all in his children's business. Every aspect of your life, God has a way he wants you to conduct yourself. We live in such a shallow world now. Why do you think so many marriages are failing now? Two shallow people marry each other and create a shallow relationship. And then, over time, the people in that marriage begin to realize how shallow the person they married is. And there is a form of Christianity which is rampant in the church today. And that is shallow Christianity. A Christianity of those who just say, Lord, Lord, but they have no true faith in Christ. Their profession is shallow. And shallow Christianity is satanic to its core because it teaches people to live like the devil and profess Christ. Shallow Christianity is satanic to its core because it lures people into a false sense of security. All I need to say is, Lord, Lord, and my faith in Christ is true. Yet my life before and after salvation is exactly the same. No, brothers and sisters, I am not preaching a false standard of perfection. I am preaching salvation and repentance. You cannot be the same person you were before and then after you were saved. True faith in Christ requires obedience to Christ and His Word. Otherwise, you are just saying, Lord, Lord, how can you state that you now believe in Christ, but your life is exactly the same as before you born again? The only thing that has changed is that you now profess to be a Christian, but yet you still use cuss words like you used to. You still lie, cheat, and steal like you used to. You still fornicate like you used to. You still commit adultery and cheat on your husband and wife like you used to. Shallow Christianity wants you to just state you are a Christian, but live like hell itself. Matthew 7, verse 13 to 14. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in threat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Shallow Christianity deceives people into wanting to change. Matthew 7, verse 13 to 14. There are people who are actively attempting to make the narrow road broader. There are people who are actively attempting to make the narrow way broader. They want to make it so broad that everyone, regardless of their lifestyle, their beliefs and doctrines, will end up in heaven. Live in sin, but go to heaven. Don't believe in the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ, but go to heaven. Live as you like, do as you want, but all will go heaven. That is shallow Christianity. The truth we all need to know in the eyes of the Lord, the words that come out of our mouths have little to no importance to the Lord. God is interested in obedience to His will, not profession alone. When was the last time you heard a sermon about obedience? Very rarely do you hear a sermon about obedience, but the truth is a true Christian is obedient to his Father's will. If I am going to be honest, there are some things in the Bible which I don't like. The fact that they are there because they are going against what I want to do. For instance, with the issue of revenge, I struggled with accepting God's will on revenge because I grew up with the nature. If someone hurts you, you hurt them back twice as much. If someone punches you, 
punched him right back. That's just always been my personality. But as I grew in maturity as a Christian, I understood revenge is never the right option. Although I wanted to retaliate, I have become more and more obedient to God's word. Obedient to verses like 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. The salvation will change you. The Holy Spirit will change you. You will begin to see the fruit of the Holy Spirit in your life when you were born again. You were not born again. And then God throws you to the walls and leaves you to navigate this world alone. No, you have a guide, the Holy Spirit, who begins to show his fruit in your life when you were born again. Galatians 5, verse 22 to 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. The fruit of the Spirit is the change in our character that comes about because of the Holy Spirit's work in us. The Holy Spirit will change you. And Galatians 5 verse 22 to 23 gives us examples of how the Holy Spirit will change you. Let us look at just one change the Holy Spirit brings into a person's life. Self-control. One of the proofs of God's working in our lives is the ability to control our own thoughts, words, and actions. It's not that you will be 100% perfect 100% of the time. It is progressive. It is to move closer and closer to holiness. To use myself as an example, I was able to now control myself to not retaliate and repay evil with evil or insult with insult. And we do not move closer to holiness through our own ability, but through the Holy Spirit. We do not move closer to the will of the Father through our own ability, but through the Holy Spirit. He has given the Holy Spirit to each believer as a guarantee or deposit or down payment. All who are established in Christ by God and anointed with the seal of God's Holy Spirit by God are guaranteed by God to spend eternity with God. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. Set his seal of ownership on us and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. We are to do the will of the Father. We are to hear God's word and do it. James chapter 1, verse 22 to 25. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Matthew 7, verse 21 to 23 states, Lord, Lord, have we not, the people Jesus speaks of here, had impressive spiritual accomplishments. They prophesied, cast out demons, and had done many wonders. They listed what they had done. They were defending themselves based on their works. They did wonderful and godly things for God's glory, which is good and is his will. But they expected not alone to get them into heaven, which is not good and is definitely not his will. It is likely that Judas participated in some or all of these things, yet he was never a true believer. I am not preaching this sermon to condemn you, nor am I preaching this sermon to judge you. I don't know your life just like you don't know my life. I cannot judge you or examine your life for you. Only you can. I cannot point the finger at you. I have no right to. But I encourage you today to examine yourself and take this examination seriously. There will be people who genuinely believe they are Christians. They genuinely believe that they are born again. But they are wrong. And they will be told, depart from me. We are not saved by works or through our own goodness. We are saved by grace. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 to 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Once a person is born again, they are filled with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will help them do the will of the Father. Also in the last days, perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers. It takes the grace of God to change us, folks.
How can you be saved if you're not willing to repent? And the Lord Jesus Christ said, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish.